Hey everyone, how you doing? It's Rob Ryder. Uh, today we're going to be talking about military claims in the Terrorism and Risk Insurance Act, which is in all of these uh, uh, municipal corporations' insurance policies. And that uh, this is what we probably should be doing with the situation we have now is filing claims against the, using that as our entry, entrance point. And so I'll talk more about that when we get to it. But uh, I also wanted to mention that you, right, need zinc and some probably some tonic water, and you need it today. And uh, I had uh, I already started this video three times, and it keeps there's just too much going on, on the internet, so I can't have all my windows open I normally would, so I, I can't give you all the pictures, right? But uh, basically, what's going on, if you listen to what's going on, right, is um, they're using this anti-malaria drug and zinc at the same time and apparently the anti-malaria drug which is nothing more than quinine which is the stuff in tonic water which is the reason there is tonic water is because tonic water was used you know a hundred couple hundred years ago for malaria right but uh, tonic water so the tonic water opens the cells the uh, red blood cells and it carries the zinc in but it it's the zinc that's doing the business with whatever the disease is we have now because we're all really zinc deficient. And this is just, you know, like super energizing the cells with zinc faster than they could normally get it. Now, apparently they're using like 250 milligrams a day and the normal dose is 20 to 40 milligrams a day. And so, you know, if you're not sick as they are, then don't use that much. But if you're using some or you're not using any, well, you should be taking... 20 to 40, which means taking 50 to 60 isn't going to hurt you. And, uh, you know, drink a bottle of tonic water. Get it into your cells quicker. I'd be doing it myself, but <laughs> I got any money. I got a car. I can't get to the store. So I have to wait till I find a way to get all that taken care of. But uh, I was going to show you this video that a guy, that a doctor had put on where he was talking about zinc glycinate, G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E, Basically, it was just a doctor talking about uh, how to test yourself for zinc levels, right? There's a really easy test. They have this really low dose zinc you take in a, you know, uh, into your mouth. And uh, if you don't taste metal, you need zinc, right? And then however long it takes you to taste the metal that you taste metal means, you know, that's how zinc deficient you are and so forth. But that your sense of smell and your sense of taste are... Uh, have a lot to do with your levels of zinc, and if you don't uh, have them, then you won't have a good sense of t taste, and good sense of smell. Well, people that are complaining with this coronavirus say they've lost their sense of smell and their sense of taste. Right? They're zinc deficient. So, you know, again, the the, the malaria drug itself isn't what's curing them, it, but it carrying the zinc into the cells is what's allowing them to cure themselves. Let's put it that way. So enough on that, and hey, because it is Good Friday 2020, and it's a very, very important day in the life of Christianity, and just in the life of the world we live in, I am going to make my profession of faith. And if you want to join in, feel free, right? So uh, uh, let us pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he arose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, world without end. Amen. Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, U.S. Army veteran, zinc glycinate. Remember that stuff. Uh, if you want to email me, it, it's or you know contact me. It's better to email me because I don't look at the comments very often in videos. Uh, quarter record at AOL.com is my email address or uh, my phone number if you have to call me. But uh, you know I can only do so much in a day, so I can't do a lot with all of those all the time and. Uh, I don't really have any answers. I'm looking for them like everybody else, right? But I just go try things and do it. And 
Now I'm going to be trying military claims and terrorism risk insurance because of the things I had learned recently, which included, um, so this is for the military claims, which comes out of Title 10, right? So if you're a veteran or you're the survivor of a veteran, um, well, there you go, right? In uh, Title 10, Volume 3, we have it broken into these different subtitles. And if you put in, uh, let me see here, find military claim. Claim. And if it doesn't take too long, because it's just, everything is, see, it's not looking for military claim, just military. Military claims. There we go. What do they call it? Uh, so, Chapter 451, Military Claims. Now, this is for the Army, right? So, um, and we're talking about amnesty claims, right? But it says Secretary of the Army. So, every branch has got their section, like Section 451, but you know, I'm in the Army, so I'm looking at it. And it says, uh, the Secretary of the Army may settle or compromise an amnesty claim against the United States for damages caused by a vessel, comma, or in the service of, comma, the Department of the Army, or by other property, blah, 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 blah. Now, when they use commas like that, it's like they're setting things off. So, I believe this means, and, I, and it, it proves itself to mean that, right? That because I was in the military, right, I can file a claim for damages against the Army. You know, they call it an amnesty claim, but it's really just a military claim, right? Military claims, but they call them amnesty claims. Well, so be it. Um, to go with that, then, is they have this, because these are claims against the United States, right? And so in 32 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 536. You might want to write that down, right? Because this was Title 10, United States Code, right? This is Title 10, United States Code, which isn't the same as the Code of Federal Regulations, but they go together. So this says that the that the um, Secretary of the Army for the you know for the Army, but the Navy would have their own Air Force, so forth. Right, has the authority to settle military claims, which are claims against the United States, which are covered under 32 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 536, claims against the United States, in which it says, uh, prescribes policies and procedures to be filed in the filing, investigation, processing, and administrative settlement of Department of the Army generated non-contractual claims. So if it's not a claim for a contract, then it's a claim for a tort. Those are the two types of claims there are. Right? We're not making contractual claims. We're saying, hey, there was a wrong. So um, Section uh, 5361 through 536 contains general instructions. Da, 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 da. Um, the Judge Advocate General to assign areas of responsibility, TJ, U.S. Commander. Oh, okay, so somebody delegated it. Finally, you know, the Department of the Army gave it to, uh, to the Secretary, and the Secretary gave it to the Judge Advocate. The Judge Advocate has given it to U.S. Army Claims Service to carry out these responsibilities. So who has the authority? The U.S. Army Claims Service. And the proper mailing address of the claim service is, you might want to write this down, or you might want to download this, right, is Commander, U.S. Army Claim Service, Office of the Judge Advocate General, Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, with a nine-digit zip code. So this is where, now this is interesting because this is where you get led to when you go online. They send you to, you're going to end, you would end up talking to uh, like human resources under uh, Fort Knox. But this clearly says it's Fort Meade. 
So I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to mail my claim to this address or find this address online and see if they have an email address and send it to them that way, right, to send the claim. But you can see what it is, right? There's This is who should get the claim. Because, see, we're talking about torts and uh, in the federal government, right, that would be an SF-95 form. SF-95. Hopefully this stuff comes up quickly because... Um, yeah, standard form, right? Claim for damage. Let's just look at one. Claim for damage, uh, injury, or death. And so right here, submit to. Who are you going to submit it to? Well, you're going to submit it, like it said in the freaking act, which is probably different for the Navy and for the Air Force, but, you know, you guys are, you guys have got it figured out, right? It's... Where do I send it? The proper mailing address is the USARCS, is Commander. Right? So that's part of the address, Commander. U.S. Army Claim Service, Office of the Judge Advocate General, Fort Meade, Fort George G. Meade, Maryland. All that's going to go on that front line, that first line, right there. Right. And, uh, of course, this would be you. Uh, what kind of claim? Well, it's military. We're doing military claims. Wonderful. Uh, well, that's what I'm saying it's for myself because this claim form is used for all sorts of things, right? But in this case, it's for the military. Basis of the claim, property. So I'll do another video on this. I'm just saying, well, okay, I get it. Here's this form. Here's what the law says or the regulation. Right? This is the regulation that says what we're using it for. And then it says over here, um, a little bit more clearly, what it's used for. So sections uh, 536.20 through 536.35 apply to settlement of claims under the Military Claims Act, which is 10 U.S.C. 2733, for personal injury, death, or property damage. Well, those are all torts. Caused by members or employees of the DA acting within the scope of their employment or otherwise incident to non-combat activities of the DA. Um, right, so I'm saying for myself, right, that I right now should be getting pay because I was never released from the military. That's what many of my videos have been about for veterans, right, that no veteran has ever been released from the military because you don't have an order that says you've been separated from the military. And I've shown where it says you got to have these things, da 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 da. You know, nobody has them, right? It doesn't exist. So I'm I'm being paid uh, either pay uh, for active duty or pay for like disability retirement, which is what I believe they did based on my DD two fourteen. But all that retirement pay is going into this thing they call the military retirement fund. Military Retirement Fund, go look it up, right? Go Google it. It exists. And the thing has over $1 trillion in it. But every year, it's funded more than all of the uh, uh, retirement that needs to be paid for that year. So there's really no reason to have anything in the kitty, right? What it's showing is that people that are being paid, their money is going into this account instead of going to their pocket. That's why it's in here, because it's been deferred, or they're saying we have a small debt we haven't paid, or for whatever reason, there's uh, a reason we're not getting the check, and the check is going into the account. I'm going to put a claim in and say, well, that's wrong. That's mine. I want it back. So anyways, there you go, right? Um, so claims under the for personal injury. Death or property damage. I say they damaged my property. If you were in the military and you got hurt in the military, you should file a claim and say, well, I got hurt in the military. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if it was the Army's fault or not. It still happened. So put the claim in. Million dollar claim. Two million dollar claim. That's what general liability normally is. One or two million dollars per occurrence. So I think we should be filing claims about anything that happened to you. If you have Agent Orange issues, file a claim. Say it's personal injury. 
Right? They, the Army didn't mean for it to happen, but it did. Well, then file the damn claim. Because it's all based on strict liability. Or that's how it's supposed to be done. But, you know, that's not how the insurance company wants it to be portrayed. What they want you to do is go sue somebody. Because when you read these policies, if you open a lawsuit, then they're going to defend the lawsuit. But if you just file a claim, they can settle it. So file the claim first before you open the lawsuit. Right? And, and try to do it through... Um, and then when you read deeper, well, all of these policies have an arbitration clause in them. So they've already agreed to sell it out of court, yet they want you to open a lawsuit. No, I don't want to open a lawsuit. I want to settle the matter. And the terrorism policies that they have in the county and municipalities and so forth, their, their general liability is a $5 million per occurrence. And all it takes to claim terrorism is that they coerced you. They put you in fear. It's in the policy. We'll, you know, we'll look closer in a second. But but this is for military first. So I'm talking like for veterans right now, right? This is what you want to do. When I have it figured out better, I'll do a better video. So I don't have an answer yet, right? So don't. Sergeant Ratluski doesn't know how he's going to do it yet, but he's going to do it. And I'm going to do it um, using uh, an SF-95 form. Or just writing something and sending it to the address and say, you know, and say, I want a waiver. Right? I don't have to be an expert. To me, I don't have to be an expert at these regulations. The people under the regulations need to be an expert. I just need to say, hey, this is what the regulation says. Right? Just do this for me. I want to do this. Because here's another one, right? You can file a 139 UCMJ claim the same way. So this, you know, this act, this 32. Code of Federal Regulations, 32, Title 32, CFR, Part 537, uh, or 536, right, is all about the United States, claims against the United States through the through the Army. And uh, my it's not my point now to go through all this, just to point out that it exists, right? And uh, if you could find a black sheep attorney... Right, one that's actually honest, because there is there is rare black sheep, or I mean black swan, excuse me, black swan attorney, not a black sheep, a black swan, black swan attorney. Go find one. Right, the honest one that will just tell you how to do it and do it without doing a lawsuit. Right, do it for a fee or for a percentage. That's how it should be done. But they want to take you, you know, they want to take you to a court of law. Well, that's why. They have these people called uh, public adjusters that are adjusters for the insured or the claimant, which is really you, me. And so I had shown this in another video that if you're a public adjuster in Michigan or you've been licensed, you know, you don't even need to be in Michigan. I'm working with a guy now who's an adjuster in Texas who's going to get the license in Michigan. All he's got to do is pay $15, right? He's already licensed in Texas for $15. He can be licensed in Michigan. And in this act, though, Professional Investigators Act, because this is all the things that most people who would call themselves a public adjuster don't realize they have the authority to do, because they're an insurance adjuster. It means a person, other than a professional investigator who for consideration engages in uh, activities described in subsection or subdivision E in the course of adjusting or otherwise participating in the disposal of claims under or in connection with the policy of insurance. Insurance adjusters include any of the following, right? And so you got the ones that work for the insurance company and the public adjuster acting for claimants. This is what a public adjuster is, that one, right? I, I, I. It's the guy we're looking for. And I, 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 as the public adjuster acting for the claimant, can investigate, have an investigation business that allows them to do all the things in E, which is what they were talking about up here in D, right? Engages in the activities described in E. Well, what are they? Well, here's the first one. Crimes or wrongs done or threatened against the United States or a state or territory of the United States or any other person or legal entity. That is what they're investigating, because we're saying it's a tort, and a tort is a wrong. 
right? So these torts are um, could be against the laws of your state or of the United States, which is really what they are, because if you don't have a proper oath of office, well, that's a wrong against the United States. So, you know, a uh, public adjuster can, in, can investigate that for me. Well, what does that mean? Well, he can get me whatever documents I want, right? Which is I want the insurance policy and the proper procedure for filing a claim against that insurance policy. And uh, these public adjusters can get subpoenas from, you know, administrative subpoenas from the um, insurance commissioner. So it's really, really powerful shit. It's like, I would go get the license now, but all of Michigan is shut down. You can't do anything. And Well, I hate to say, I don't have any money. I can't even pay my rent. Right? But that is the freaking truth. So if you can help me out, and especially if you've been watching my videos for quite some time, help me out. Right? Send me a donation. Contact me at the way I said, right here, right? And say, hey, I want to send you a donation. How can I do it? And we'll figure it out. Send me an email or give me a phone call. Because, man, I'm, you know, I'm really working hard to get this done, but I ain't got nothing to work with. Okay, so that's what we're doing, right? Uh, next, for, so for myself or for any other veteran, you know, let's just think through this here. I'm saying we have a military claim because they never issued the order to release us from the military. And if you go look at a DD-4 form, which is the form they have you fill out that has the enlistment on there, it has all the things in there that uh, you're agreeing to. And, you know, you agree, you've you agreed that they can keep you in at, during a time of war, whenever they decide, whatever. But if they do that, they have to pay you. That's what you agreed to, too, to be paid. <laughs> and so, you know, I know that we're being paid. It's just not going to the right place because there's an error in the records. Well, that error is a tort or a wrong done by the United States against me and fix it and give me my property back. Which is in the, uh, what's that thing called? Military Retirement Fund. It's got a trillion dollars in it. What the hell's a trillion dollars doing in that fund? That money should all be in, should be either in a survivor or a veteran's pockets and spent into the economy, and we wouldn't have to have this dribble drabble where they're going to try to give us as, uh, you know, um, to help boost the economy. Just give veterans their trillion dollars; they'll take care of it. We will gladly help the economy. And so that's what we're going to do. See, I'm, I have a real problem with the fact that this. Just today, the governor of Michigan, who isn't the governor of Michigan, but the lady who thinks that she is, has just said, well, uh, you can't get together over the weekend and uh, you're going to have to stay in your house. You can't even visit your neighbors anymore. Well, she doesn't have an oath to office. You know, so why is she telling me to do anything? So that isn't necessarily this claim here, but that would come in more into this other claim, which is uh, terrorism. Risk Insurance Act. So I'm going to need a second to pull it up. I don't think I pulled it up. Hang on a second. So let's take a real life example, right? Of, uh, you know, we should be thinking outside of the box. So this Tampa pastor, right, was thrown in jail by a tyrannical government for holding service last week. And, uh, you know, now he can't have service anymore. You know, so uh, the prosecutor issued a arrest warrant. He was given a $500 misdemeanor or something like that. I'm going to have to go read the whole article again, but I'm not that interested because, first of all, Pastor, they're not the government. They're just pretending to be. This is my point. They don't have a proper oath of office. So you have a reason to file a tort claim against them, right? So, um, well, who arrested you? Could be the city, the state, or the county, but whatever it was. It's always the state because the state's name is at the top of all the paperwork. But nevertheless, you could go to the city or whatever the jurisdiction was and do a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, and ask for their liability insurance policy, right? And, uh, well, then a few days they send it to you. You know, I don't know. Anybody's had a problem getting one that's asked for them. It's just, what do you do with them, right? This is where, well, where's the expertise of the... Uh, 
of the public adjuster, right? Make sure that everything gets done right. But, you know, what I noticed right away on this one is name of the insured, city of St. Charles, comma, a public entity, right? That's the name of the insured. It's not city of St. Charles, it's city of Charles, comma, a public entity. So if you're not, if that isn't who you're putting a claim against, you did it wrong. All right, these are the jots and tittles of the law that we have to pay attention to. This particular one hasn't been signed either, but, you know, who knows? They seem to think it's legit because they sent it to her. Now, they have this whole long list of all these different things that this particular policy covered, um, like commercial general liability coverage, where was the professional? Law enforcement liability, public entity management, public entity employment, law enforcement liability. Uh, you know, they're acting like the government. That's like political insurance. One of the things I covered in another video. Okay, and it goes down here and has... Da, 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 da. I don't have time to go through all this because it just makes these a little bit too long. But I wanted to get to... Oh, well, look at this. Hey, Religious Freedom Protection and Civil Union Act. I bet you there's something in there you could complain about. Right? I'm, not, I'm not claiming to be an expert at the law and all these different things. They're saying all of these things are covered in their insurance, so go file a claim, Pastor. But that isn't the one I was thinking about. Right? I was thinking about this one, the Federal, Risk, the Federal Terrorism Risk Insurance Act Disclosure, which basically says... They all read a little bit different, uh, not every different policy, but the Federal Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, right? So the act is called the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002, as amended, which would be the TRIA, establishes a program under which the federal government may partially reimburse insured losses, as defined by the TRIA, caused by acts of terrorism, as defined by the TRIA. I guess we should go read the TRIA and see what it has to say. Because uh, act of terrorism is defined in section 102. Well, they're even going to tell you here where to go find the definition of the TRA to mean any act that is certified by the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Attorney General of the United States to be an act of terrorism. To be a violent act or an act that is dangerous to human life, property, or infrastructure. To have resulted in damage within the United States or outside the United States. In the case of certain air carriers or vessels or premises of the United States mission. And to have been committed by any individual or individuals as part of an effort to coerce the civilian population of the United States or influence the policy or effect conduct of the United States government by coercion. Well, Pastor, that's what they did. They coerced you not to have, you know, your services. That's an act of terrorism. Armed men with guns came and told you, you can't do that. Well, I'm afraid that's dangerous to human life, property, and infrastructure. Because they don't have a proper oath to office. They just think they do, but they don't. I'll show you, right? Just, we'll get there, but they don't. And because they don't, well, <laughs> it's an act of terrorism. You don't have to prove it. There, there, there doesn't have to be any fault. It's all strict liability. If the facts show that it meets the definition, well, then it is. And so what you need to do is you need to get the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of Homeland Security and uh, Attorney General of the United States to agree that it was an act of terrorism. So they must have some little association of their own, right? It's like the treasurer, Homeland Security, and the Attorney General. All get together. There's three people. That's the smallest democracy. Two out of three wins, right? They can make a decision if something is or is not. And uh, based on that decision, um, if they say it is, well, then you just got paid. <laughs> and if they do it again, well, then you do it again. But they won't do it again. See, because if you put hits on their insurance, the insurance companies won't insure them anymore and they'll have to, they'll just cease to function. They'll cease to exist. 
See how easy that was? Now, um, you can take this a step farther, right? That's just going against a municipality because of something that they did to you. But if you're going to court for some reason, like the prosecutor, he has insurance as an attorney, right? He has like some kind of errors and omissions. So do doctors, so do uh, any kind of professional, right, that uh, have a license to do what they do, um, have the, you know, have the right or have the ability to have errors and omissions insurance. And I hope for their sake that they do. But um, all of these people on their licenses, like for an attorney, well, um, his name will have been enrolled in the role of attorneys for the state. And then the role of attorneys for the state, you'll find his name with his full legal name, like Robert Allen Rutluski. But when you look at how he puts it on paper, it would be Robert A. Rutluski. Well, then he's not using the name that's on his license. That's a tort. I don't care if he meant it. I don't have to explain it. I just say, well, that's not the name on your license. That's a tort. That's an error or omission. You admitted putting your name on a legal document. Now, so, you know, this is a big deal because you only have one name for legal purposes, right? It's your full legal name. They say it's the name that's on your birth document or the federal government would say, well, it's the name that's going to be on your real ID compliant ID, right? Because that's the name that goes on a real ID card is your full legal name. And people are running around. They don't want this damn thing. It's, you know, you people are idiots. You need to get a clue. Yeah, you want to be identified, right, by your full legal name and say, yeah, that's my name and I'm not answering to any other name. Because when they take you to court, they're not using that name. They're going to get you to agree to be something else, right? But they're going to be charging your property under that name. So somehow, you're because your name is a business, you know, I have an EIN in my name and I have a social security number in my name. Robert Allen Rutluski has an EIN and it also has a social security number. Right, in fact, hang on a second here. Maybe this won't take too long. Depending on how things are acting now. Uh, let's see. The IRS. 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 My IRS EIN number. All right, employer identification number. 82-36-54-127 for Robert Allen Rutluski. Well, I thought that was you. Well, that's my business. All right, so now I've captured it too because now it and my social security number, because I did it as a sole proprietor, now it is tied to my social security number, and my name, and my address, and so if anybody's putting a claim against that, then I see you're putting a claim against me. Now, I could, and I showed in my videos, right, under this name right here, because it is a business, I could go get insurance, uh, general liability insurance, and uh, an adjuster told Bob, well, you know, because he had never heard of doing this before, but he said, look it, if you had insurance, it would be easier. I could just put a claim against your insurance. And then the insurance companies will work it out. Instead of us trying to go find their insurance. Right? Because maybe, the, you know, an attorney doesn't want to give you their insurance policy. That's what all these, that's what the, the question was. And he said, well, you know, if you had insurance, I could put it against your insurance. Well, you, and I'm saying, well, you could have insurance for like $30 a month. Uh, on the read the back of the can video I did, you'll see I'm showing this online company that, you know, you could claim to be a housekeeper. You look at the defi definition of housekeeper and it's, you know, the person that owns the house. Okay, I'm the housekeeper. $30 a month, I could have $2 million liability insurance for Robert Allen Rutluski, that business. And what this adjuster's telling me is then he could put a claim against my insurance Right, that uh, um, that then the insurance company would go and uh, collect against the other insurance because my policy would say in there, you know, these same things that it, has, it covers for malicious prosecution and 
false arrest and liable and slander and, you know, da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> so if, uh, you know, if you're going to court and they're not using your name, well, they slandered your good name because they're making you be something you're not. Well, that's slander. Right? You're not, you know, you're, it's liable. You're putting my mugshot into a, um, you know, into some system where it shows up in a freaking newspaper where, you know, here's the pastor. I'm sure this is his mugshot. It's like, well, that's, you know, that's liable and slander because the people that did that don't have an oath of office. That's just the way it is. Here, let me show that law real quick so I don't forget. Yeah, everything's slowing down again. I got to hang on a second. Okay, so, you know, the easiest thing to do is Google for USC 101 and look for this thing where it says govinfo.gov. All right, because these are coming from the government printing office. And you click on it, and it gives you this page, and you say, okay, I want a PDF. Whatever you want. It'll download it for you. It's a really good system. And when it does, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Not really sure why it's quite so slow today, but probably a lot of people home using the internet. So this is a federal law, right? This is Title IV United States Code, Section 101, and it says, Oath by members of legislature and officers. Every member of the state legislature and every executive and judicial officer of a state shall, 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 shall before he proceeds to execute the duties of his office, take an oath in the following form. To wit, I, Robert Allen Rutluski, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Period. Quote. Done. All right? That's not the oath they take. All right? And they don't put their full legal name where IAB is. In most places, times it just says I and it would go on without even having the name there, the ones that the state uses. Right? So, if they don't have this oath, they didn't satisfy the federal government. Now, if the state wants to have another oath because it has a constitution, whatever, well, that's fine. They can. But they still have to do this one. Right? The federal government comes first. The United States comes before the states. So, first you've got to satisfy the United States. Then you can satisfy the state. And you can go ahead and play governor. But until you've done this, you can't be governor. And the, the person claiming to be the governor, nobody else has. So, well, I hadn't found that thing about the Federal Terrorism Act and so forth. You know, I need to go read about that. But what I had done, just because I, you know, want as an example to show people, right? Uh, I, I decided, well, I'm going to go and write about this and put it in. Uh, uh, letters to the editor, right? So I picked like the Lansing State Journal, the Detroit Free Press, Grand Rapids Free Press, Washington Post. You look all these places up and they'll let you send a letter to the editor, you know, through the email. So I said, I'm going to do that. But then I said, you know, I'm going to take all that now. I'm going to send it to the Secretary of the Army because of this, you know, this military act and the fact that he has the authority to do these things. And, you know, I'm just going to lay it all on his doorstep and see if he'll deal with it. So, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm forwarding for your attention my latest attempt to inform the government that the person claiming to be the governor of Michigan is an imposter who filed a counterfeit state oath and completely omitted filing a United States oath that conforms with 4 U.S.C. 101, you know, the one we just looked at. The, le the alleged legislature, legislators in Michigan have also failed to follow instructions and committed the similar wrongs. I have previously appoint, uh, pointed out that members of the members elect the United States Congress have also failed to follow the law and have law filed unconstitutional oaths of office using fictitious names. Sorry, it's kind of hard for me to read. The United States is in default of the Constitution of the United States as Michigan is denied a Republican form of government by usurpation of authority and instead the people of the state of Michigan are terrorized by belligerents engaged in insurrection, rebellion against the United States, who impersonate elected officers and legislators. 
all that to say, right, that uh, basically because the governor hasn't taken a proper oath to office, right, Michigan has denied a Republican form of government because a Republican form of government guarantees you're going to have elected officers running the show. And we don't have any. The people that are just pretending to be running the show, they don't have an oath of office. And I, you know, <laughs> dude, I'm a staff sergeant of the United States Army. I ain't going to go any further. I'm just saying, no, you can't do that. No, no, no. If you try, I'm going to call in the Army, right? That's what I'm going to do. I'm calling in the Army. I've had it, right? Please send the United States Cavalry because these fucktards think they have authority. But there's nobody in the in the uh, Michigan legislature, the governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state, the treasurer, none of them. None of them have taken proper oath to office. It's all usurpation. And it's all part of this idea that we've been under war, under martial law since 1861 and the war between the states has never ended. And uh, But Trump just did something, and I really wanted to cover this. God, I almost forgot. See, I had the material of me. Uh, where's that proclamation at? Did you see what Trump did yesterday? I know everybody, you know, the Q fans are waiting for something big to happen, and they may be downtrodden because it didn't happen today, but just yesterday, right, issued on the 8th, which would have been Thursday, but or Wednesday, but going into effect for the 9th, which was yesterday, a proclamation on National Former Prisoner of War Recognition Day 2020. Proclamation on National Former Prisoner of War Recognition Day. Now, anybody who's been a prisoner of war, I don't want them to take this wrong, right? Because that's, that, that's a group all upon itself, right? But the way this is written, if the United States was still under martial law, which I say we have been since 1861, right? Uh, and the evidence that we are is that there's gold fringe flags in courtrooms, which can only be displayed in certain places. I mean, there's a regulation for that freaking flag. It can only be in certain places. And it's not a Navy flag, it's an Army flag. Right? Wherever that flag is, is the Army. And so, you see it in a courtroom, it's, that's a military courtroom. Right? So, I, I guess it could be in, it, it says military courtrooms. It doesn't say just Army courtrooms. But, you know, it's pretty specific where that flag can be. That and like chapels. Right? So, when you see it in a church, a gold French flag, well, to the Army, that's a chapel. And that flag in a church is evidence that that church has some authority within the government. And so I would think that the pastor could use that channel, right? That, you know, we're not using this authority we have. Um, and that's a whole other subject. But I just wanted to talk about this. That just yesterday, uh, this proclamation got issued, which said, uh, since our founding, brave men and women who have selfishly answered the call of duty to defend our precious liberty, have shaped the fabric of our nation. In the course of fighting for our freedom and security, many of these heroes have been captured and often subjected to shocking conditions and unimaginable torture. On National Former Prisoner of War Recognition Day, we honor the more than 500,000 American warriors captured while protecting our way of life. We pay tribute to these patriots for their unwavering, un unrelenting spirit. Okay, well, are these deceased or are they current? Right? I'm saying right, right now that, like myself, I'm being held as a prisoner of war because I don't have my ID card. And we're at war, and I'm, you know, in the military because I was never released, so I must be a prisoner of war. Well, he just released me yesterday. In every major conflict in our nation's history, Americans prisoners of war, POWs, right? So that's like there's two different things. You have American prisoners of war, and then you have POWs. Have stared down our enemies, knowing at any moment their captors might torture them yet again or even kill them. These patriots, however, knew that they were fighting for something much larger than individual survival. They persevered for the sake of their fellow POWs, comrades in arms, families, and country. Later this year, we will commemorate the 75th anniversary of the conclusion of the World War II. 
Over the course of that war, nearly 94,000 American troops in the European theater and an additional 27,000 in the Pacific theater were captured and held as POWs. Right? As POWs, but not American, but not American prisoners of war. As POWs. Right? It's like two different classes. Subject to starvation, lack of medication, medical care, and unimaginable suffering, these Americans endured hell on earth. The POWs who returned home were forever changed. Many bore the unseen, the seen and unseen scars and wounds of war, having experienced the worst of humanity. Though we can never fully understand the depth of the brutal imprisonment and mistreatment as Americans, it is our duty to ensure all former POWs receive the love, care, compassion, appreciation, and support they deserve. It is our national obligation to remain mindful of the tremendous sacrifices their family members and their loved ones endured over months, years of uncertainty, worry, and heartache. May the Stories of these warriors inspire us to live each day with fierce conviction, indomitable will, everlasting pride for our country. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim April 9, 2020 as National Former Prisoner of War Recognition Day. I call upon Americans to observe this day by honoring the service and sacrifice of former prisoners of war to express our nation's eternal gratitude for their service. I also call upon federal, state, and local government officials and organizations to observe this day with the appropriate ceremonies and activities and witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand this eighth day of April in the year of our Lord, 2020 and of the independence of the United States of America, the 244th, Donald J. Trump. He didn't say hand and seal. He just said hand. That's interesting. So we don't have any seal on this one. So I'm saying this is like a dual-use thing, right? That I'm a national prisoner of war, right? He just released this. That's fine. I'm a former national prisoner of war. But like in the, at the end of the, you know, the second or of the uh, Civil War, when they had prisoner exchange, right? You were supposed to go somewhere and get registered and so forth. So, you know, I got to check into that. Are we supposed to do something now that he's done this? Like he's just released us all, right? We're all now former prisoners of war. We're not. We're no longer national prisoners of war. We're national former prisoners of war. Something like that. I mean, why else would he put this in now, under the you know, at the time where things are happening, the coronavirus, and we're at war, and um, you know, we got the troops down on the southern border and in the Caribbean, stopping the war on terror, the war on coronavirus, and the war on uh, illegal drugs. That's what General Miley said he was going down to do. <laughs> we're going to defend the United States. It's not time to come. Right, we're so yeah, they they're defending the borders of the United States. So uh, there's something going on, and this proclamation got issued yesterday. A good deal. Okay, well that's really all I had for today. Right, I'm working on putting it all to work now. But um, just to recap, right, if you're a veteran. Right, you may want to go down and, uh, you know, Title Ten, just Title Ten, United States Code, Volume Three. Google it; you'll find it. And then all these different sections depend. You know, go to your section or to your service, and it's going to lead to whatever Code of Federal Regulations covers your branch of service. Excuse me, but for the Army, it's Part Five Thirty Six. Claims against the United States. Now, it maybe it's for everybody. I don't know. This just says that you know that claims against the United States can be put in by uh, um, let's just read it real quick. Yeah, what's the general provision, right? Because they always tell the best stuff right at the beginning. What's the purpose of all this? Part five thirty six prescribes policies and procedures to be followed. 
for the filing, investigation, proce processing, and administrative settlement of Department of the Army generated non-contractual claims. So 536 through 513 contain general instructions and guidance for the investigation and processing of claims and apply to all claims unless other laws or regulations specify other procedures. All right, so there you are. You got a claim against the United States. This is the way they want you to do it, unless there's some other law. So, you know, what you do is you send it to them, and if they process it, I guess there was no other law. But if there is, they'll send it back and say, well, no, you got to do this because there's another law that does it. They're usually pretty good at telling you what you need to do. I mean, what you've done wrong, right? It's just we don't usually go and do it. Uh, they are intended to ensure the, that incidents that may result in claims are properly and efficiently investigated under supervision adequate to ensure a sound basis for official action that all claims resulting to such incidents are expeditiously settled. The Secretary of the Army has delegated authority to the Judge Advocate General, the TJ to assign areas of responsibility and designate functional responsibility for claims purposes. The TJAG has delegated authority to the commander, U.S. Army Claims Services, that'd be the USARCS, to carry out this, these responsibilities. USARCS is the agency through which the Secretary of the Army and the TJAG discharge their responsibility for claims administration. They handed it over to the USARCS. And the proper mailing address for the USARCS is Commander, U.S. Army Claims Service, Office of the Judge Advocate General, Fort George G. Meade, Maryland. Put, put that on your envelope, right? That's where you're sending it to, right? That's who you're putting the claim into, and that's who the on the SF-95 would go to. And now, who, what can you use it for? All right. Well, we need to go and investigate a little closer what uh, uh, what the Military Claims Act actually says. But you know, I showed you in Title Ten, it talked about military claims. Right. That's what this is. It, military claims, right there. Military claims. Good or not? Right, you got a military claim, you're going to put it into the military claims. Military claims. Right, because this is the one for the Army. Then it went to the Navy. And the Navy, as I remember, they didn't call it military claims. They just called it claims and... Well, what's this one? Military claims. Part 3, Part 2, Part... This is the Air Force. Okay, yeah, here it was. Claims. Right, the Navy calls it claims in 653. And then we go to... Air Force and the Air Force, they go back to calling it a military claim, and so that's what can happen. You got a military claim, they got an answer, right? And the answer is, at least for the Army, to send it to the commander, U.S. Army Claim Service. And so that's my intention to the claims that I have filed before for. Um, In fact, I should go find that, because I just did file this thing. But I didn't file it to this address. So hang on a second. Okay, so here's another thing I tried. Right? This was, uh, I found an email address. It was help at us.army.gov. So let me send it there. Right, and address it to the Department of the Army and say, well, get, uh, to the Secretary of the Army, you know, say, hey, get it to him. So I did this uh, just a couple days ago to the uh, Secretary of the Army, our Army, Honorable Ryan D. McCarthy, Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, Social Security Number 374506794, slash, it's a class action. Under 10 U.S.C. 84802, amnesty claims against the United States, damages in the service of the Department of the Army. That's what I said happened to me. All right, so I, state your name, Robert Allen Rutluski, claim that the occurrence of error and omissions in the Department of the Army records damaged my enjoyment of pay, allowances, privileges, 
in the military identification card owed me by the government of the United States for my continued honest and faithful service as an enlisted member of the United States Army. And I file this suit directly to the Secretary of the Army for relief in accordance with 10 U.S.C. 4802, because it's his job to take care of it. Now, I didn't realize at the time, or maybe I did and I didn't pay attention, that they had the address there to send your claim to. So, you know, now I'll mail it to the right place. But, you know, hey, it was this is the idea, right? Uh, what am I complaining about? I'm complaining about, because there's an error on their records, I don't get pay, allowances, privileges, my ID card that are owed me by the government because of my honest and faithful service. I have a certificate said that I have on, that, you know, that I was uh, congratulated for my honorable and faithful service. I have attached Exhibit 1, which is correspondence from the U.S. Army Human Resources Command, Army Service Center, dated April 2nd, 2020. I just got this here just last week. That conceals my full legal name. Right, I sent it to them as Robert Allen Wartlewski. They sent it back to me as Wartlewski, comma, Robert. See what I'm saying? By using the pseudonym Wartlewski, comma, Robert. And the alphanumeric string, da 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 How can this be official? I object. The Army Service Center did not perform an aggressive search of my military service records. It only pretended to. This letter evidences identity theft and use of simulated legal process as part of a larger scheme to disenfranchise enlistees and their servers, survivors of pay allowances, privileges, identification, and annuities. And I have to or forget, when you're doing an SF-95 to the government, they're basing it on, it sounds like you find a, a state law and saying that this is what got violated in the state law, right? Because they're basing it on the law of the state. So we'll get there in a second for me. But, um, so uh, I also attached Exhibit 2, a letter from the Army Board of Correction of Military Records dated uh, March 21st, 2017, that uses the alias Rutluski Robert A. as my identification, thus depriving me of my true identity by the omission of a material fact of my full legal name, which is Robert Allen Rutluski. Sir, no other style name is legal for official business. You only have one legal name, right? And on two different letters, they've used two different names, but neither, neither of them are my legal name. So, Mr. Secretary, I never received a notice of separation, separation order, or separation pay in accordance with my DD-214, Separation Authority, that's Block 25 on your form, which in my case is AR 635, Chapter 4. You go look that up, right? It's Army Regulation. Read Chapter 4 and see what it says and say, well, it didn't happen. Right? I'm going to say it didn't happen. you got to prove it happened. And Separation Code JBK, Block 26, which characterizes my honorable service. Because JBK, when you get into the weeds in it, says that I can't, you know, that I would be barred from reenlistment. I can't stand for that. It's a false statement in an official matter involving the United States to insinuate I was barred from reenlistment, as alluded by the footnotes in AR 635 and the separation coding. I couldn't remember what the number was at the time. But, you know, they have all this information on what's on your DD-214, and so I was just using it. The truth is my DD-214 reenlistment code is RE1A. It's block 27. And that the Army loves me. I had no problem. I could have reenlisted any time. No problem whatsoever. Come on back. Thank you for your honorable and faithful service. Right? That's how I left my business with the Army. I just didn't know that they were, you know, they weren't done with me yet. And they never contacted me. So, Mr. Secretary, I am also denied proof of my identity and DOD affiliation. Thus ensuring I am un I unable to collect my pay, benefits, and privileges. The United States is at war, both foreign and domestic, and both DOD policy and the Geneva Convention Treaty mandates I have an Armed Forces Identification Card. The Department of Defense Manual 1000.13 states that, this DOD policy, according to reference C, that a distinct 
DODID card shall be issued to uniformed service members, their dependents, and other eligible individuals, and shall be used as proof of identity and DOD affiliation. I was not separated from the custody and control of the Department of the Army, and my reenlistment or my yeah my enlistment con and my enlistment contract with the United States guarantees my pay and benefits. It is my belief that the NA in Block Nine of my DD two fourteen evidences that I was disability retired, which is one of the, there's only two things it can mean with an NA in Block Nine: either I'm disability retired or I was released from the military. But they didn't issue any separation order, so, you know, <laughs> I can only guess I was disability retired. So anyways, uh, and that I am still in the Army and authorized uh, to receive retirement pay, but my pay is held in arrears in military retirement fund because of errors or missions in the Department of the Army's identification records. It's all about their errors and their records. I may have caused the errors, but when I did it, I was in the Army, so it's the Army's fault. Sir, you have the power and authority to correct these injury, these injustices. I believe many other veterans have similar errors and omissions that when corrected will pave the way for the release of $1 trillion of retirement pay from the fund into the veterans' local economies and turn ID card carrying veterans into an asset of the United States military government. Because that's what we have now. We're under martial law. There is no more government. In fact, everybody should go read the Lieber Code, right? Go look at, uh, we are under martial law, and we should all go read the Lieber Code, which is the government of the armies of the United States in the field or something like that. And uh, you read Title Two or Article 2, it says that, you know, once martial law has been declared, until there's a proclamation or a specific treaty of peace um, that says that it's ended, it's still going on. And so there never was a peace treaty or a proclamation after the, uh, Civil War, and there wasn't after World War One, and you know there never has been. So we're at war, both internationally and domestically. Anyway, so that's why I asked him, right? And uh, I just sent it to the email address I said. But here's, so if you're a veteran, you got to have mail like this laying around someplace. You know, you ask a question, they send stuff back, and it's, I didn't send it as Ritluski, Robert. I sent it as Robert Allen Ritluski. And, you know, it doesn't have my any social security number here, so it's not properly identifying me. So who do I know who this is for? What, what they did is they checked this box here and say that records of military service for verification of employment or to verify service requested are not available at this command. Well, that's not what I asked for. I just asked if you had my records, any of them. Because you'll see down here that they could have checked this box. That said that an extensive search of military service records, DD-214 or equivalent, has indicated that the documents are not available at this command. But that isn't what they did. right? I asked for this. Proper case, military service records. They gave me a box check that said that there wasn't any lowercase proper military service or records of military service. That's not what I asked for. I asked for military service records. Right? So you see, it's all in the words. This is their this is their fucking game. So, you know, they didn't do what I asked, and then they lied about it using a fictitious name and no social security number. So officially, this never happened. Right? There's an error in the official records because it came from the Department of the Army, and it's done wrong, so it's officially wrong, period. Uh, and who did it? Of course, nobody signed it, right? So I'm, I'm complaining. Now, here's the other one I did. I was, you know, getting my records changed, which they did do, by the way. But here, I'm Rutluski, comma, Robert A. Right? And uh, Mr. Robert A. Rutluski. And it's like, well, anymore, fuck it. I'm not a mister or anything. I'm sergeant. If you're going to use title, I'm staff sergeant. SSG, Robert Allen Rutluski. Otherwise... You can call me Robert Allen. But don't call me Mr. I did a video a long time ago about being called a Mr. It's not good, right? It's, uh, and I can see since they're having these things done under uh, Admiralty law, you know, they have Mr.'s are an office in the, in the 
in the Navy. They call people a mister. And we have misters in the Army. They're warrant officers. Right? But I'm neither of those. Anyways, here's my DD-214, which has an NA in box 9. Uh, I never signed it. Right? Remember, unavailable for signature. They never sent me another one. And you need, uh, if you don't have this longer version, right, that has the stuff at the bottom, if you only have the short version, which I had only had for the longest time, I didn't know there was a longer version. But I finally got this by going through the archives, like they say to, to the, uh, out in St. Louis, I think it is, and asking for the long version, right? And they sent me the Service 2. So just tell me you want the Service 2 copy of your DD-214. See, I should have checked this box here, right, that I wanted copy 4, which is a long one like this, but I wasn't there to sign it in the first place. So I didn't even know all this stuff existed, that they had this other information down here. But I know that when you look up JBK in the in the separation code book, you know it would say that I'm not a uh, I wouldn't be authorized to reenlist. But reenlistment code RE1A says yeah I can reenlist anytime I want to. And when I go look at the separation code to do this, this would be an administrative separation. It says well I should have got a separation order, or a separation certificate, and a separation DD214. All at the same time. I didn't get any of them, right? Because, you know, this isn't done. This one isn't done yet because I haven't signed it. They, they, have to, they owe me uh, um, an updated version. So it's like I didn't even get one. This is just a piece of paper with no legal value for saying that I'm out of the military. And since I'm not out of the military, I must still be in the military. And I got one more thing to show just because of that because, you know, this is where it all comes down to if you're enlisted. All right, look at a DD Form 4. Let's hope this goes quickly. Uh-huh. Here's a DD four four Form 4 that every enlistee would do. It says... Uh, for all enlistees and re-enlistees, you know, all these things are going to apply. And uh, it's it's more than an employment agreement. It affects changes in the status from civilian to military member of the armed forces. Did you know once you take an oath of office, you're always in the military? Right? You still are in the military. Uh, required to obey all lawful orders? Yeah, I get it. Subject to separation during the end of my enlistment? Yeah, I get it. Subject to a military justice system, I get it. Required uh, upon order to serve in combat, I get it. Entitled to receive pay, allowances, and other benefits. I'm not getting it. Right? I've done all these other things, but I'm not getting any pay, and they've not released me from the military. I understand that the many laws, regulations, military customs, will govern my conduct and require me to do things under this agreement that a civilian does not have to do. I also understand that various laws, some of which are listed in this agreement, directly affect this enlistment agreement. Some examples of how existing laws may affect this agreement are explained in paragraph 10 and 11. I understand that I cannot change these laws but that Congress may change these laws or pass new laws at any time that may affect this agreement, and that I will be subject to those laws and any changes that make to this agreement. But I further understand that I'm entitled to receive pay, allowances, and other benefits as provided by law or regulation. Right? I'm entitled. It's not a benefit. It's owed to me. So if you went on to read this, it would tell you that, hey, during a time of war, under 10 U.S.C. 506 and other in uh, 12103C, that they can keep you until six months after the war has ended. Well, we're always at war. The war on drugs is a war. Right? The uh, the Cold War was a war. They gave a certificate that said thanks for your participation in the Cold War. Right? It was recognized as a war. So, you know, if they haven't released you and given you a... a, a an order 
it says you've been re released from the custody and control of the army or navy or whatever it is, and they can't produce it, then you're still in, and they owe you pay. And I filed a claim for pay in arrears. You know, that was some time ago now because it, unfortunately, that we, you, you try to do their paperwork that way, it takes 90 days, 120 days, 180 days to get an answer. But I'm going to go the shortcut route now and just say, I'm going to go right to the man. I'm going to go to the man who, uh, according to this here, I should be sending my claim to the United States Army Claims Service to the commander, the U.S. Army Claims Service, Office of Judge Advocate General, Fort George Meade, Maryland, this address and no place else. And when you follow that, you know, when you follow the trail online, you end up going to uh, Fort Knox. And it's like, well, this just it didn't say Fort Knox, it says Fort Meade. So maybe you have to mail it to them. Maybe you can't use the Internet. Right. But, uh, you know, you could certainly do a certified mail or registered mail to them. And well, then you would know it got to the right place. And so that's what I'll be trying this afternoon. And we'll see how it goes. You know, I won't be able to mail it now until well, I may be able to get a mail yet today. Now nah, it's too late. Uh, anyways, I'm going to, I'm just going to put it regular mail and send it in. See what happens. I'll let you all know what goes on next. Okie dokie. That's it for today, guys.